Venice has become the first city in the world to introduce an entrance fee for tourists to curb crowds in streets, canals and on bridges during the peak holiday season. Signs were hung all over the city to warn day-trippers of the new mandatory 5 euro fee. Due to the new entrance fee, protests have sparked in the city. Reservations must be made online, but a booth is also available on site for those without smartphones. Although there are no turnstiles at the city gates to check possession of the pass, inspectors will conduct random checks and issue fines, ranging from 50 to 300 euros for failure to register. The system is very important because uh, we are finding a new balance uh, between the residents, the community and the day trippers. So we are just trying to discourage uh, the arriving on day trippers in 29 particular days and uh, finding a new way to know in advance how many people will arrive in Venice the day after. This is unfair, depriving people on a low budget of the opportunity to come here for an hour or two and enjoy the city is just sad. Yes, I don't think... After all, we're already paying for a lot of things. Museums, sightseeing, eating, sleeping, hotels, and then there's this new entrance fee to the city. I don't think it's right. A half-hour gondola ride along Venice's picturesque canals costs up to 100 euros per person, so an extra 5 euros certainly won't scare you off. In short, gondola traffic will not suffer after the introduction of the world's first payment system for tourists. When you see how crowded it is today in a national holiday, yeah, you could expect something uh, like this, like uh, an extra entrance. Uh, so I think, uh, yeah. I agree, I agree. We are from Germany, we are born with Texas, so <laughs> it's just another one. Those with hotel reservations and guests under the age of 14 do not have to pay, but must register in advance. Students, employees and of course residents are exempt from the fee. And yet they are not happy with the idea of the authorities and are organizing protests. The banners read, here we live and here we will stay, hands off our city. No for tickets. It's a sad day. Venice is becoming a museum, a theme park. Today you pay to enter the city, and it is a city that does not deserve this insult. They call it a flow management system, but they don't manage anything, they don't regulate anything. We are against this solution because it will in no way stop excessive tourism, a real problem for the city that has serious consequences. About 20 million people visited Venice last year. During the peak holiday season, up to 120,000 people a day flocked to the historic part of the city, inhabited by nearly 50,000 people. Polish President Andrzej Duda and Lithuanian President Kitanas Nauseda met on the last day of the week-long Brave Griffin joint military exercises along the Suwałki Gap on Friday. The Suwałki Gap is a strategically important stretch of land that's considered a potential flashpoint area in the case of a standoff between Russia and NATO. The border, almost 100 kilometers or 62 miles long between NATO members, Poland and Lithuania, is also a land corridor between Belarus a Moscow ally, and Russia's Baltic Sea exclave of Kaliningrad. The drill included 1,500 Lithuanian infantry soldiers, nearly 200 members of Poland's 15th Mechanized Brigade, and U.S. and Portuguese military personnel. Speaking at the drill, Nauseda said the idea of deploying nuclear weapons would be a deterrent to Russia. The idea of deploying nuclear weapons is not warmongering, it is not a threat to Russia, but it is the same element of the deterrence system, which is supposed to be a really significant deterrent and a force. The Russian propaganda mill is churning, and naturally in such cases there are always threats from their side, but the threats seem to indicate that this idea is indeed a significant deterrent and naturally makes Russian politicians nervous. Polish President Andrzej Duda said on Thursday, April 25th, that he had invited Prime Minister Donald Tusk for talks on May 1st about the possibility of nuclear weapons from NATO states being deployed in Poland. Wiecie Państwo znakomicie o tym, że Rosja od lat 
You know perfectly well that Russia has been relocating its weapons and military, reinforcing its Kaliningrad enclave for years. It is not a secret to anyone. Among others, Iskander rockets have been relocated there over the years. There is probably a Russian nuclear weapon there. Therefore, it is Russia breaking the international treaties on spreading nuclear weapons. It is Russia who today relocates its nuclear weapons to Belarus. Therefore, I have no doubt the reaction from NATO countries is necessary. We need an adequate answer, and therefore I think that the whole NATO area should be tightly protected with nuclear weapons, and therefore I think that the nuclear sharing program should be extended to the countries on the NATO's eastern flank. Until recently, the land border was seen as vulnerable, because if Russia were to ever seize the Suvauki Gap, it could leave Lithuania and the other two Baltic states, Latvia and Estonia, cut off from Poland and other NATO allies. However, that perception of the corridor has changed since Sweden joined NATO in March, as the Baltic Sea now is almost surrounded by NATO countries, and any attempts to cut off the corridor would not leave Baltic countries severed. The Baltic Sea is Russia's maritime point of access to the city of St. Petersburg and Kaliningrad, which is separated from the Russian mainland. The border stretch named after a nearby Polish town also provides land access connections between Belarus and Kaliningrad. Russian citizens have a visa waiver arrangement for passing through the area. Australia is committed to supporting Ukraine and has also become much more illuminated about what is occurring in Europe, the defense minister said on Friday, April 26th, during his visit to Warsaw, Poland. We are very committed to supporting Ukraine um, in its conflict with, with uh, Russia, uh, but we have also become much more um, uh, illuminated about what is occurring in, in Europe um, and in that sense the relationship with Poland uh, is put into sharp relief and we see that there is enormous opportunity for our two countries to work together. When it comes to military cooperation, we take up the challenge of preparing and signing a contract on collaboration in the field of defence and security between Poland and Australia. We have also started talks and taken actions to work on the trade, with particular focus on the arms industry from both sides. We will be participating not only in trade shows, but we will also be preparing reciprocal offers for each other related to the development of the arms industry. Last week, Marles announced Australia will boost defence spending by 50.3 billion Australian dollars, or 32 billion US dollars, over the next decade and reshuffle its weapons programs to emphasize missiles, drones and warships as it looks to the possibility of a Pacific conflict between China and the U.S. Australia, a NATO partner since 2014, contributed to NATO-led operations in Afghanistan and Iraq and is one of the largest non-NATO contributors to the West's support for Ukraine. Australia has been supplying aid, ammunition and defense equipment, including scores of Bushmaster armored vehicles. Australia has also banned exports of alumina and aluminum ores, including bauxite to Russia and has sanctioned about 1,000 Russian individuals and entities. The international historical competition in the footsteps of Polish history, where our family came from, is guided by one goal, patriotism. If these children do not learn this in the normal educational cycle and they can sing or draw the works so beautifully, of course probably with the help of teachers or parents, but if it is a common education, then patriotic Poland is growing for us, and that's the point. Each time the organizers are delighted by the involvement of the younger generation, not only of children living in Poland, but also of Polonia, who engage in learning about Polish history in their free time. I also learn patriotism from Polish schools abroad. They study the other language there during the week, 
And on Saturday and Sunday, they want to and passionately come to classes related to Polish history and Polish literature. More than 2,300 works from all over the world took part in the contest. The judges had no easy task selecting the winners. All the works were great, beautiful. The spirit of patriotism was shown. There were also moments of emotion. It is necessary to cherish these values, such as God, honor, homeland. Children dealing with the history of Poland, even if only for a moment, this is one of the most important things you can do. All these works are evidence of beautiful work at home, beautiful work of the family on history and on memory, something like that which is positivistically important and meaningful, otherwise history will not be taught properly. The competition was attended by elementary and high school students, as well as preschoolers. Categories of the competition included artwork, patriotic songs, poetry and film. About the Olma family, we wanted to play it as realistically as possible. What lesson for yourself do you draw from this work? that helping others is very important, and it doesn't matter who is from what nationality, all you need to do is help. My project was a set of four stamps. I made all of them in black and white colors to make them look like a historical film. Parents have the greatest influence on a young person's personality. We lived many years abroad, several years actually. For us, returning to Poland was something amazing. We want the children to develop, learn Polish culture and Polish history. The growing interest in the contest, organized by the Committee for the Remembrance of Witold Pilecki, gives hope that even for the youngest, the history of their homeland is an important part of their identity.